welcome to the Doggy Dojo. My name is Trevor Smith, and today we have Zach George in the house. Hey, what's going Ooh. on? And of course, Daisy is here as well. We're going to talk to you guys about what you need to do before and after you get your puppy and help you be the most successful with your new canine companion. Zach, for those that don't know Zach, um, you have an incredible YouTube channel. On that channel, what, what can people find on that channel to help them out with their dog? Well, you know, my team and I, we produce the world's most watchdog training videos. Um, so you'll learn how to train your dog virtually everything. At least that's our goal. So we're always trying to fill in the blanks, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to have you come here and give us some information on canine fitness and, and all the other stuff. I, I love how Jade is working on skateboarding. Yes. Cool, right? Yes, and those that haven't checked that video out already, I'm gonna leave a link in the description down below. The other thing you guys are doing, which, you know, if that wasn't enough with this amazing content, you're also on Instagram, yeah. you're posting virtually every day as well. Yeah, at Zach George. Right. <laughs> follow me on Instagram. Go follow him on Instagram, because he has a lot of great content there as well. To get started, what we should do is we should talk about first, like what is the very first thing you should do before you even get a puppy or a new dog? That's a tough question because there's so many things. I, I guess in my view, and I, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about this, but in my view, I think it's really important to assess how much time you have available right. for a new puppy because it's, it's really easy to underestimate the amount of work and time a dog requires in that first year of life, that first year of training especially. I mean, training goes on for a lifetime, but that first year, man, you can't trust a puppy. They don't know anything yet. You gotta teach them every little thing, and that's no small task. When getting a new dog or new puppy, you wanna make sure prepare yourself, prepare your home, prepare your family, make sure everybody's on board, because if it's just your dog and your family's not into it, it can make things a little bit more complex. So make sure the whole family's on board. Those kids that want to convince their parents on getting them a new dog, one of the most important things you can do is just show the prep work. Make sure you research the breeds, find the ones that can be great for your family. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's definitely true. Because a lot of kids, you know, they want, they want dogs for Christmas and stuff. And you know, you don't want to think of a dog as just like another present that really is like a 15 year commitment in, in many cases, sometimes longer. And I like to talk about that with my dog parents like that, that, you know, when they have a kid that's six years old, I talk to the kid and I say, you realize this dog's going to be here when you're in like high school? Yeah. That you're going to be here, you're, this dog's going to meet all your friends and have a, an amazing time with you. So it's real important to get involved in the training early on because as you grow up, the dog's going to be able to grow up with you, which is an incredible thing to have. But at the same time, so much is true that the fact is these dogs, they don't get enough attention and they start causing problem behaviors. And that was a really great thing about the canine fitness video. We've showed many ways to exercise your dog, both physically and mentally. Yeah, yeah, it, it all goes into it, man. It's a, it's a bunch of work, it can, but it can be the most rewarding work ever. You just gotta have the right mindset, don't you? You do. Once you've done the preparation and you know what kind of dog you want and the family's all on board and you go out and you get that dog, where, where, where do you find is a great place to find a dog? Like, what do you think is a great? Well, I think there's a number of great ways. I encourage people who are looking for a great family pet to look at pounds, shelters, rescue groups, and right. things like that. The best pets in the world come from these places. Um, though breeders have their place too. I mean, right. you know, responsible breeding is a fine art and you'll want to really do your homework. I talk about this in my, in my first book, Dog Training Revolution, uh, on, you know, things to consider for both angles. But I, th I think the majority of people would be very well served with a rescue dog. I found that book was very helpful. You do really cover a lot of ground in that book about taking care of your dog, both before and after. The other thing I would have to say is you have to decide what age you want to get. Like, yeah. You know, if you are really committed, you know, you could get a puppy. A puppy takes a lot of commitment. There's a lot of training that goes into raising a, uh, a good puppy, and um, it takes a lot of hard work. And that's where, if your whole family's on board, it can actually be quite an easy process if everybody's teaming up and working together. But when it's just up to one person, whether it be the mom, the dad, or the kid, it can get overwhelming really quick. Um, that's where it comes into play. And you know, the fact is we can look at getting a dog from a breeder or look at a dog from getting a rescue, but the real question is, is what is gonna be best for your family? Mm -hmm. And I find sometimes rescue can be a very effective way because one of the things, especially a good rescue that fosters dogs inside homes, is those people usually know what that dog's behavior is inside a house environment. So I think rescues can be a fantastic thing. And like we talked before, some of those rescues will actually allow you to foster that dog for a little bit just to make sure it is the right fit for your family. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to go about it, to foster them, to make sure they're the best. I, yeah, I have nothing to add to that. That's a, cool. well said. 
So now that you got the dog and you're, you're, you're happy, this is a great moment, and then all of a sudden the realization hits, like, I gotta do some training with this dog. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what are your recommendations for training? What, what, where should they start? Uh, well, number one, if you have a job, quit it. If you're in school, stop going to school. Just basically give every waking moment to your dog. Yeah, it's <laughs> there's actually jobs yeah. that are right now currently actually paying employees. And if your job doesn't do that right now, without <laughs> risk of being fired, I don't want anybody getting fired for me saying this, but you know, if you can get some puppy leave, just like people do with babies, then that actually might not be a good bad thing for the first week or two of your dog's life. But yeah. but but no, in all seriousness though, I mean, you know, controlling the environment is the biggest mistake that I find new pet parents make. They just don't control, they keep their dog off leash way too much, yes. give them too much freedom too yeah. early on. And you know, we're all anxious to give our dogs freedom and they deserve that freedom right. at some point in the future. Correct. But never trust a puppy is my philosophy. Well, so even an adult dog, I've seen this too. Yeah. So like, you know, just because it's a three year old Labrador retriever, doesn't mean it's not gonna uh, pee in your house or chew up your stuff. That's right. That's <laughs> so you right. need to make sure to treat any new dog into your family like it's a puppy and make sure it's that. And I had this question or talk with you earlier too. You know, it's crazy for me to think that sometimes people think to leave their dogs unsupervised. And those that do this, I'm not trying to get down on you guys, but scientific studies have shown that dogs, even at an adult age, have the brain capacity of a three-year-old child. Mm -hmm. And usually people don't leave their three-year-old children left alone at the house alone to their own demise, you know, so. Right. So it's real important to think that mindset that if you wouldn't leave a three-year-old child alone in this situation, then you probably shouldn't leave your puppy or your brand new dog either in that situation. Yeah, at least unless they're in a very controlled setting or yeah, with somebody ideally is right. the ideal way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's um, it catches a lot of people off guard how much how much work a dog is. But if you control their environment and you focus on giving them age-appropriate exercise, particularly early in the day and just before leaving them alone if you must for right. ideally shorter periods of time rather than longer periods right. of time, um, those are all things you can do to kind of mitigate a lot of those problems and you know just get a dog to adjust well in my experience. I think so once you have the environment set up and this is where that research comes into such big play. If you've gone through that prep work like we talked about here, this is going to be real smooth for you for the most part because you already know exactly everything you need when it comes to supplies and materials and how to set up your house. Just like when you get a brand new baby in the house, you kind of baby proof the cabinets and the plugs and stuff like that. You're doing the same thing for your dog. You're kind of kind of helping puppy proof your environment. And so that's really great. And then when it comes to training, of course, the biggest resource that you guys can do is go to Zach Dorr's YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, so I, which, I appreciate that. Which is a really great channel full of tons of great training tips. And I know there's great tips that you guys can check out on the Doggy Dojo as well. Yeah. Um, and But when it gets to a point, there is some uh, case to be made to working with a professional and working with somebody that's a, particularly a certified dog trainer, I would have to say, but somebody that has a lot of experience in dog training that are using scientific and humane methods. Yeah, modern methods. Because, I mean, I mean, you work in the dog training field, obviously, you're a dog sure. trainer, and you know how much, I mean, how much, um, Oh, trying to be diplomatic, Tre uh, Trevor. It's hard. You I know. know it's hard so, these days, right? Yeah, there's a lot of unprofessionalism out there in the dog training world. There are a lot of people who are still using electric collars, prong collars, choke chains, and things like that. And, and at least in my view, you want to avoid trainers who promote uh, using aversive methods like that because we now know of much better, more effective, and humane ways to teach dogs. Right. And we, I talked about this word with you before about the word is consent and that we want to build with, with consent. We think of that in, in a whole different terminology. But like with a dog, there's a consent factor where if your dog is training with you and playing with you and engaging with you, you want to make it sure it's on their will and wanting to do these behaviors for you. And mm -hmm. so often when we force our dog to do these behaviors that we want them to do, particularly with using for tools, when the tools are not there, the dog doesn't can continue those behaviors. Um, and so you want a behavior that's stronger than just the tools alone, that, that, that goes beyond the tools, and that the dog will want to do these behaviors for you again and again and again. And I can't tell you how many times that I've seen that when people do it right, that when you ask your dog to stay or come or sit or stand, they're there's a light in their eyes. Like they're excited to do these games for you because the whole time that you've done this without using tools, without having to go overbearing on them, they are doing this out of their own will and it's exciting for them to be able to do that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Make a dog want, rather than making a dog do something, make them want to do the thing. And that's, you know, that's kind of one of those things as a good dog parent that we're constantly doing, not only with our environments, but the way we're training is we're trying to craft a really good environment and a really good path for our dogs and I think 
a great way and a great analogy I've heard about that. It's like a plant. If the plant is not growing, we usually don't necessarily always blame the plant, right? We try to make sure the soil is okay as well. If, if the soil or the lighting or where it's out in the sun, if it's not in the right place, the plant's not going to thrive. Yeah. So if you do that with your dog too, if you find that your dog is struggling, it may not be the dog. You know, a lot of times it's not. It's usually something that we need to kind of adjust or change in our lifestyle for the dog to be more successful. Yes, truth and a wonderful metaphor. You know, there's going to be times where you need to go to work or you need to kind of be separate from your dog. Do you believe in crate training or is that something that has deemed as possibly being cruel to do to your dog? No, I mean, it can be cruel. Right. A lot of things can be cruel. I think crate training is great, um, but I do think traditionally, in, in my personal view, that that many professionals encourage a dog to spend a little too much time in a crate. For example, conventional right. wisdom right. for many years has been, okay, if you have a puppy, uh, they need to be in a crate or they need to be outside or you need to be watching them directly at all times. Right. Uh, and so, so many people fall into this mindset of keep the dog in the crate for hours and hours unless they're going on a potty break. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I've tried to kind of get away from spending too much time in the crate is by encouraging people to attach their dog to them so that you're in a position to supervise your dog, right. encourage behaviors, nip bad habits in the bud, and you're really kind of forced to train them when you have a right. dog attached to you, you know what I mean? Right, it's right there with you. And actually those times are even sometimes better because sometimes when we're just kind of having more structured training sessions, for instance, like if you're just training your dog for 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night, every single night, that's going to be great. That's going to be awesome. I think people are going to have such a good experience with their dog training then. But I find the more meaningful types of training is when you're doing it throughout the day in these little small micro sessions, particularly with a puppy because they have such short attention spans. So when you're working with a puppy or even a brand new dog, you know, keeping it simple, keeping it short and keeping it rewarding for the dog and they're not burning out is a very great way to improve your dog's relationship with you and their want and drive to play and train with you. Yeah. Yeah, but crates, just, just to get back to your question, I think right. they can be they're a very valuable way to control your dog's environment. You just don't want to overdo it. Yeah. I find myself really going to oversized crates, so because traditionally the crate should be just big enough for your dog to turn around and lie down in when right. you're potty training. But a lot of dogs really pick up on that pretty quick. And you yeah. can kind of make it artificially small with a divider panel. But and with many dogs, you can quickly evolve into a much bigger crate. So they have plenty right. of room in there when you do have to have them in a crate. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the thing is like, you know, it, this watch and confine scenario, when people hear the word confine, they think, oh my goodness, I don't want to confine my dog, especially since I've been to work all day. You know, they want to have them out running around. And there is that balance, right? We want to make sure we're not always confining our dogs in a crate. And I love that thing that you talk about, the game of putting the leash on you or having it attached. It's just a really good, or something that your dog can do like a puppy playpen or just cordon off their areas where they can't get too far from you mm -hmm. and they can be in the same room with you are really great things. But you also are looking at the fact that when they are um, making those choices and being around you is they're actually getting reinforcement from you. And the biggest relationship that you need to really get with your dog is that relationship with you and developing that bond with you. If the only times they're interacting with you is when you're punishing them mm -hmm. or yelling at them or telling them not to do something, We've all been there with relationships in our lives like that. We don't want to hang out with that person as much anymore. That's right. So you really want to set up situations for success with your dog, like we've talked about, where constantly when they come see you, that there's more times of them being rewarded for a good experience versus being punished for a bad experience. And that's what's so great about using scientific and humane methods and modern training. That's a great way to say it, is that that mindset of being proactive versus reactive with your dog's behavior and with your dog's training is such an essential part of the puppy raising process. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Zach, for joining here on the Doggy Dojo. It's been great to have you here. It's been great to be here in this wonderful studio oh. that you have here. This place is amazing. Your team is amazing, like I said. So, oh, I appreciate that. Likewise. <laughs> awesome. Always awesome working with you, Trevor. Yeah, it's been such a great teamwork together and such a great yeah. collaboration. Um, Zach is the real deal, guys. You guys definitely need to check out his YouTube channel and his Instagram. If you've learned anything or been inspired by Zach George, I'd love to hear about it. Go ahead and leave a comment down below for Zach and let us know what you have been inspired about or learned from Zach George.